right. Come on. Come on, somebody. It's not hard to preach after that video right there, right? It's awesome. You heard from Pastor Chris. Uh, he's actually in the in the second most beautiful nation on this planet right now. He's in Sweden and, and, and doing some ministry and visiting uh, friends over there. So come on, let's pray for our pastor. Let's pray for Pastor Melissa and lift them up. Remember them in your prayer. And let's pray also that when he's in Sweden, this second most beautiful nation on the planet, uh, let's pray that he's got a good time and feel rested and encouraged over there as well. And you heard from him, we're going to do Turn It Loose here in the month of June. And tonight is the soft launch of Turn It Loose. So I could not be more excited than I am right now. But before I go into the Word of God tonight, uh, when I was here praying right before service, probably 10 minutes before service, all of a sudden I remembered something amazing. I remember that today, May 30th, is my spiritual birthday. So tonight I'm 21 years old. Uh, 21 years ago tonight when I heard the life-changing gospel, the good news about Jesus. I did not grow up in a Christian family. I did not know anything about the Bible, but I met Jesus May 30th, 1997 when I was 15 years old and it changed my life forever. So even when I was praying for right before service started, I, I had tears in my eyes because I, I realized uh, that that tonight there might be sitting a 15-year-old Daniel in this room. There might be someone listening online and, and, and someone that will catch the word, someone that will catch the fire, someone that God might call after that experience, a call to the nations and forever be changed. So if I, listen, if I preach with a little bit more passion than normal tonight, if you think I'm a little bit too loud, just give me some grace because I'm preaching to someone that will catch the fire, someone that maybe 20 years from now will have a testimony similar to mine. And I could not be more in love with Jesus that I am. I mean, I'm growing in it every year, and I just love Him. I love Him. Every song we sang tonight, I sang from the bottom of my heart, because I know 100% I'm nobody without Him. I'm no one without Him. But in Him, I mean, He's taken, He's show, He's given me a beautiful church family. He's, he's sent me all across this world. Who am I to experience so many amazing things? It's only because of Jesus. So if you don't know Him, if you don't, if you don't understand why He's so special, I've been praying for you that you will understand it tonight. I've been praying for this service and when as I as I was praying for it, God stirred something in my spirit and, and 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 gave me a word. Something I've been to be honest studying for years and years and years. I've been so you're gonna you're gonna have a, a years of study tonight packed in a message. I shared with one of my friends here on staff in Re at, at Reach and, and I said I, I, I feel like I need to preach about this and 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 he said well Daniel that's impossible. You, you, that, that's like that's too much to preach about. I said, I, I don't dare me. I don't challenge me because it's there. I need to preach this. So we're going to start tonight. Uh, I believe God will bless you. I believe God will e equip you. I believe God will challenge you with this word tonight. So we're going to start here. Just lay a foundation from Psalm 24 and verse 1 here. It says this, the earth is the Lord's. Did you hear that? The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all its people belong to Him. Amen. Right? The world is the Lord. Everything belongs to Him. Now, that's amazing. And then I'm going to give you the second scripture for tonight from 1 John 5, 19. And I deliberately leave them both there on the screen so you can compare both of them. Then it says this, we know that we are children of God. And that the whole world is under the control of the evil one. So, so now, now, Daniel, now you don't get me confused right away here because you're saying that the world is God, is the world God's or is it the devil's? Yes. 
<laughs> oh yes, we're going to have fun tonight. I'm telling you, they, they might look like they are now mutually exclusive. These two scriptures that it contradicts itself, but I promise you they are not. I will put on the coat of, of a Bible teacher tonight, something I love to do. So if you have a pen or a pencil, you better sharpen that pencil right now. You better put that bu buckle up and, and get ready because we got to have some fun tonight and I'm going to share a lot of scripture because I believe God wants to reveal something amazing to you tonight. So are you ready? Amen. All right. Now when you look at this there is a, a question that can steam from this and, and, and come up, stir up from this. It's the classic question. It's actually, it's actually called a theodicy. If God is, is good, not if God is God, if God is good and almighty, why is there so much evil in this world? Have you ever asked yourself that? You probably heard that question at least. It's a classic question for centuries. It's called a theodicy. And, and if God is good in Almighty, how is that now possible? It's called a theodicy problem but it's really not a problem it is a question some people treat it as a question that cannot be answered but I just want to say let's answer it tonight let, let us bring the solution to the theodicy problem tonight are you ready for that are you ready now? Come on now. I'm, I, I need, this is my birthday tonight. You better encourage me a little bit at least, right? So, so now, uh, you, you can answer this question. It just requires some time and a lot of Bible, all right? You cannot reason you, yourself into it because you're going gonna to find yourself in a black hole somewhere. But if you read the Bible, if you let the Bible reveal itself to you, then we're going to see through the Word of God. So we're going to get some answers here tonight. But before we dig into that, I just need to lay a foundation because now the, 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 the question is if God is good. Now we need to lay the groundwork first. God is good it's a fundamental truth we just sang it uh, here in the second song didn't we for the Lord is good right we sang it we declare it because that's what the Bible says now James 1 17 says every good everyone all good every good and perfect gifts is from above coming down from the Father of lights who does not change like shifting shadows you and me we try to be good most of the time but the problem is many times we change like a shifting shadow and and and, and you, he was good yesterday and now he just did something stupid yeah that's us that's us we're not perfect but God never change God is good he's nothing but good he's good all the time it's nothing evil in good God he is good Good, 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 good. All right. Now, this is what 1 John 3, 8 says. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. Now, think about what Jesus came to do. When you read about Jesus, he, he, he healed the sick. What did he do? He destroyed the works of the devil. Sickness is a work of the devil. He, he, he preached life to the poor and shared with the poor. Poverty is a work of the devil. The devil came to steal, to kill and to destroy. But Jesus came to destroy the devil's work. So all the good things are from God and the bad things are from the devil. Right. Amen. That's good teaching right there. That's, oh, that's too simple. Yeah, but most of us, that's all we need. And that can take you anywhere. If you understand that God is good and He's good all the time and that every evil thing, it comes from the devil. It doesn't come from God, okay? Because the devil wants to confuse you and, and maybe there is a plan here. Maybe God has something to do. Some Christians, now I'm, I'm getting sidetracked here, but I, I, I just stirred inside of me because some Christians, I will hear, well, I, I, I'm sick here. I have have cancer I'm blind and maybe this is God's will for my life will you never ever ever see that in Jesus's life not one time is Jesus walking up to a blind man or a sick person saying you should be happy because this is God doing your work in your life and you know what you're blind I'm going to make you deaf as well because you don't understand how blessed you are that never happens. Not one time in the Bible, but it says all the time Jesus healed 
them all. Someone needs to understand that tonight. So this is the foundation now. Most, this is enough for most people. God is good. The devil is back, bad. But then it said, we just read, read this. The whole world is under the control of the evil one. So God is good. The devil is evil. The world is under the control of the evil one. So the question is not really if God is good and almighty, why is there so much evil? We answered it. The question is probably, and this is more a more legit question, why is God still allowing that to happen? Why is, why is the devil, why is the world under the control of the evil one? And that feels hopeless and we're just puppets on strings and the devil can do whatever he wants to do. No, he can't. And we're going to see this now. So let's take this from the beginning. All right. Let's take it from the beginning. I told you, take that pen up because we're going we're gonna to dig into the Word of God tonight. When we study creation, we can see that humanity, you and me, we are not just simply another part of creation. No, the world was created for us. And I'm going to show you this with scripture here in just a minute. And, and we are the crown of creation and we were created with a purpose. What is the purpose of us? To know God. To have a, a, a relationship with Him, to love Him and have a love relationship, a, personally, a personal relationship with Him. So you're different from all the trees and all the cats and all the bugs and all the dolphins out there. You live with a purpose, to know God. You can know and love God. Now... We're still laying a foundation here. To love God, to have a love relationship with God, it requires two things. The first thing, you must be without sin. Why? Because God is without sin. The Bible calls God holy, separated from sin. And we have stories in the Bible showing us what happens when sin gets too close to God. It, it burns. It destroys. And if, if we have sin in our life, we will be destroyed. We have a story about Moses in, in Exodus chapter 33 when Moses says, I want, I want to see you, God. I want to be closer to you. And God says, you can't. You can see my back, but you can't get close to me because if you see my face, you will die. So he can't. We cannot approach God if we have sin in our life. We cannot be close to him. So have a love relationship with God requires you to be without sin. We are going to come back to that a few thousand years from now. But, but here and then the second thing we need to have an ability to love. If to have a love relationship with God you need to be able to love. Well that Ah, of course, Daniel. Like what? That, I could even have figured that one out. Yeah. But here comes the, the 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 twist to that. To be able to love requires a free will. Oh, you Christians will always talk about that free will. Yeah, but it's important. Listen now. You don't need a free will to be without sin. Okay, God could have figured that part out in a different way. He could have made us robots that would never sin and that would have been good. But the purpose is not to live a life without sin. The purpose is to have a love relationship with God. That's very different. You, when, when, you are, when you receive Jesus as your Savior and He forgives you your sin, that is not the end to it. You didn't reach your destination. That is the requirement. That is the foundation to live your purpose, to know God. To live close to God. So, so, so it's not a free will that is required to live without sin. But it is required to love. You cannot love without a free will. Love is impossible without a free will. Why? Because think about it. Love is always a choice. You have to choose to lift someone else above yourself. And to put that person higher on your agenda than you put yourself. To lift someone above your self-love and your selfishness and care more about that person. It's a choice. I don't know if you figured it out yet, but I, I haven't. It doesn't happen automatically in your life. You have to choose to love, decide to love. Many times we feel the love. We, we, can, we can be in love. We can have a crush. We can love someone with passion, but it's a choice. We have to dig into it. Now, uh, to force someone to love is an oxymoron. You cannot force someone to love. I met my wife now 
16 years ago, I think. Oh my goodness. Right? I met her for the first time and I fell in love. I'm telling you, she was beautiful. She, she still is. Like I saw that girl and I had a crush right away. And then I got to know her and I saw her heart and I was like, dang, this, this girl is on fire. I'm telling you. And look, lucky girl, she met me. I didn't think that. But, but, but here's, what I, here's what I didn't do. When I figured out that I want this girl for the rest of my life, I did not walk up to her. I did not scream in her face. Stephanie, I demand your love. And we got married. How many know if I would have done that, I would not have been married to that girl today, right? That wouldn't, wouldn't have happened. I cannot force my kids to love me. It's impossible. It's an oxymoron. Listen, I cannot, I, I, and, and this is good parenting advice now. You cannot force your children to love God. You can force them to read the Bible. You can force them to go to church. You can, you can force them to do a lot of good things, but you can never force them to love God. You need to lead them to love God. And that's another message for another time. Now, listen, listen, you cannot force someone to love it's impossible so so it's the same thing when someone will tell you like they tell me God well if God is real why wouldn't he just uh, write with fire all across the sky I am God I exist believe in me well he couldn't do that because if he does we would be forced to believe in him and the purpose again it's not to know about God it's to know God to love him, to have a love relationship with him. If he were right uh, uh, on, on the sky, we would be forced to submission. Uh, everyone would be forced to follow and obey, but we will lose the purpose to have a love relationship because you cannot force that. I'm standing up here grateful tonight because he saved me 21 years ago. And ever since that day, I'm a work in progress. I'm telling you, and I'm more grateful for every day. And that is because he did not force me. He called me to follow him. He said, Daniel, I believe in you. Oh, you stumbled again for the millionth time. But come on, let's stand up and try again because I love you and I believe in you. And I love him today because he first loved me. That relationship can never be forced so if God will ride on the sky everyone will be forced so free will is a must for love so now back to the story back to creation here the Bible is clear that God made this world perfect I'm going somewhere very good with all of this I'm excited I know the end to this story oh my goodness now the Bible says that every day God created, he looked at creation and he said, oh he, he looked and he saw that it was good. So everything God made in this planet was good. And a, a part of creation, he planted a tree in the garden of Eden. The tree was called the, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And he planted it there in the midst of creation and some of y'all you know what happened at that tree later that was where Adam and Eve fell in sin and we're getting there but but don't be mistaken now that tree was not a mistake by God that tree was not an imperfect part of creation because sometimes you might think God why did you place the tree there why did you just remove it because they fell in sin because of that tree now listen I want to I want to be bold and say this that it, it, it was not an evil spot of creation it was not an imperfect part of what God did without the tree of good and evil creation would not have been perfect follow me now because without that tree there would have been no choice with no choice there is no free will with no free will no ability to love the purpose is to love, to love God with all your heart. So creation was good. God created everything, heavens and earth, and it was all good and it all be belonged to God. And He created man and woman as the crown of creation to be like Him. And then the extraordinary thing takes place, a mind-blowing thing takes place now. Because in Genesis 1.28, when He created everything, it says, then God blessed them, Adam and Eve, man and woman, and said, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and govern it. 
reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, the animals that scurry along the ground. So God now created everything. It all belongs to God. But then he told humanity, man and woman, he said, now you reign over it. You rule. You have the authority. You govern over this place. You have a few more scripture. This is what Psalm 115 said. The heavens belong to the Lord, but he has given the earth to all humanity. Are you following what I'm saying here? This is good stuff. This will be a key to everything. Psalm 8 says in verse 5, you made him, man, humanity, a little less than God and you crowned him with glory and honor and you made him what? Ruler over the works of your hands. You put everything under his feet. So the key to understand now who you are in Christ here in a few minutes is to understand that God, yes, made everything. Heaven and earth belong to Him. But then He gave the authority. He made us to govern it for Him. Now, when I grew up in South Sweden, my grandfather and my uncles lived about three miles from my house where I grew up. And they had a farm. And, and, and I remember my mom grew up at the same farm and, and, and I was there all the time at this farm. The older I got, the more I was there every summer and every school break and helped out at their farm. And to me, it was always their farm. It was their house. It was their, the place when grandma and grandma had always lived for hundreds of years and it would live for the next few hundreds of years. It was like that place, that safe place. But as I grew older, I realized that the farm is not really their farm. I'm teaching you some agriculture stuff right now from Sweden, right? They were under a farm tenancy, meaning that someone else was the owner of the farm and all the land, but with this farm tenancy contract had given all the legal rights to govern, to plant, to, 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 to make the decisions about the land, what to grow, potatoes or, or corn or wheat, whatever. they given that legal right to decide and to to use the land to my grandfather and to my uncles and it was a lease and it was a term and it was a couple of years and by the end of that lease they would renegotiate and they would sign another one for the next few years that's how farming works in Sweden and a lot of other places I know on this planet so now that is how it worked my grandfather had the legal right to govern to decide to do whatever he wanted on this land God now gave the legal right to live to govern to rule over the earth to us to humanity now the earth is the Lord's but for a season he gave it to humanity we don't know the, the end to that term, but we know God works in seasons and we know it will come to an end one day. So the earth is now ours, ours to live on, ours to enjoy, but also ours to govern, to take care of and to rule over. And this would not be a problem when we follow God, when we live with God, when we walk with God, when He's our friend and we have a love relationship with Him. But unfortunately now we know what happened. In this story we sinned now back to that tree remember the tree was not sinful in itself it wasn't anything magical or mystical about the fruit in this tree sin was to disobey God God had just said do not eat the fruit from this tree but the man disobeyed and did walk and, 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 and acted against what God had asked them to do oh my gosh it's going to be good. It's going to be worse for a little while and then it's going to get better. All right. So because now when we sin, when I say we, you say I wasn't there. It was Adam and Eve. No, it was humanity. We sin. All have sinned, the Bible says, and fallen short of the glory of God. Now, when we sinned, we were sharing this meal with the devil. We were eating the fruit that he offered. At the same time that happened, now Adam and Eve changed and shifted the Lord from being God's people walking with God God is my Lord now they became what the Bible says slaves under sin and since the devil is the Lord of sin we became slaves of the devil and now a slave does not own anything 
by themselves anymore but everything they have belongs to their master so now what happened everything we had fell in the hands of the devil and the one thing we did have here was the authority the control of this planet so now the world fell into under the control of the evil one I wish Marvel would pick up this story and make a, a movie out of it it would be better than any any script they ever produced I mean this is good stuff right here you will be watching this movie, dang, this is awesome. No, don't eat that. And whoa, they, okay, anyway, I see all of this when I, when I read the Bible. But this is what happened now. Now it's under the control. This is why, listen now church, if you understand this, if you can gra grab hold of this, this is why the world looks the way it looks. The devil didn't just seize control. He didn't stole it from, from God, but he was given the authority by us. It was our authority, but we gave it to him. Listen, when, when, when the devil later encounters Jesus here in Luke 4, when, when Jesus is tempted, this story said, so the devil took Jesus, took him up and showed him all, how many? All the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to Jesus, I will give you their splendor and all this authority because... It has been given over to me and I can give it to anyone I want. If you then will worship me, all will be yours. Jesus answered him, it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Jesus did not fall for this temptation. But I want you to notice two things about just this brief passage here. Jesus never said, why are you lying devil? This is not yours. This does not belong to you. No, it was a real temptation. Jesus knew the authority belongs to the devil. And I'm here to destroy his work. So it was a real temptation for him. And I want you to notice what, what the devil says. It says, it has been given over to me. When was the authority given over to the devil? In the fall of man. When we sinned, we gave him the authority. We told him, now you are the Lord of this planet, it's under your control. Now you might, may ask, oh, so, so when God saw that happen in the fall of man, why didn't he just simply tell the devil, what are you doing? It's not yours. I got, no, no, I gave it to man and he would take it back and just restore everything. Well, because in Romans eleven twenty nine, 29, for God's gifts and his call, he can never be withdrawn. God, when He speaks, that word is connected to he, he, who He is. You and I, we can tweak the truth and we can lie, but God can never change His word. Heaven and earth will disappear, but my word will never, ever disappear. So now God had established an order. He had given authority to humanity and they choose to re-gift that gift to the devil. And God stands for His Word. So He didn't change it. Now, what did God do in this moment? Well, He could have left humanity and earth to its fate. He could have, he could have destroyed everything and restored it. Or, or He could have left us in the hands of, of sin and the evil one. But driven by love. God didn't do any of the above. But He had a plan, a salvation plan. Something that He wanted to do. The problem is now that he had given authority to humanity. And humanity, we had given it to the devil. So now, don't get this wrong. Don't be confused. But, but God had established an order of things. And now because of that and because of what had happened, now God did not have legal rights to, to interfere on this planet unless he was invited. Don't get it wrong. God is good. God is have all power and he can do whatever that pleases him. But God, it pleases God to establish his order and his word. So he will not break that. So now God did not just have an access to this, to, to interfere with anything unless someone invited him. So what did God do? I'm giving, you know what I'm doing tonight? I'm giving you like a brief overview of the entire Bible. That's what I'm doing. Next time you read the Bible, you're going to be, yeah, we talked about that on Wednesday night. We got the whole story in, in, in 30 minutes. All right, so, so what, did, what, did, what did God do? Well, he found this one man named Abraham. 
And we are soon at Jesus now. He found Abraham. And one man that wanted to love God and wanted to live an obedient life for God. And God only needed that. So you can read this story in Genesis 12 to, to, to 50 really. This entire story. God needed a man that would live in obedience to him to put his plan into action. With Abraham, God makes a covenant. And I wish we could talk about the covenant forever. But, but God made a covenant meaning that everything I have belongs to you. Everything I am is now yours. And he established this covenant with Abraham and everything Abraham had now belonged to God. This is Genesis chapter 15. And something that Abraham had, God wanted. A, a, a man's access to the earth again. So through this covenant now, God had a people to work with because Abraham and Isaac, Isaac had Jacob. Jacob had 12 sons that would become the 12 tribes of Israel, the Israelic people. This is why even to this day, the people, the Jewish people group is a special people group in God's eyes. Even to this day, they are above other people, the Bible says, because they choose to be God's people. They decided through Abraham's covenant to be that. So from walking with one man, Abraham, God started to walk with this entire people for 2,000 years. The people of Israel. That is the Old Testament. And they fail him. And they disobey him. And they turn their back to him. And they are not good enough. And they, 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 they do terrible things. And they betray him. But not one time is God turning his back to them. Because he remembers the covenant he made with Abraham. And he stays faithful and, and he forgives the people and he leads them back again and he speaks to the people. He gives them the law to show them what is required to live a sin-free life. He gives them prophecies about a savior that will come, a king of kings that will help them in the future. Someone that will be the anointed one, the Messiah. And he speaks to the people and then the Bible says, da da in the New Testament, when time had fully come, God sent his son. Are you ready now for the end to this? Oh my gosh. I'm ready. It's going to be good. Because God knew now it is ready. So through his covenant with this people, he had an access to this planet again. And when they started to ask him for help, he needed someone to say, God, come and help us. He needed an invitation to interfere on this planet again. And now this is the message within the message. Every time you pray, you know what you're doing? You're inviting God to do something about a situation. You invited him to interfere on your behalf. You're giving him the power and the right to do something when you speak the name of Jesus it's not a cute end to a little prayer you are you're releasing the power of God into a situation don't believe for a second that your prayers are unheard or powerless it's powerful amen all right well I don't, here we are so God came down to earth because they called for his help Jesus is born and now Jesus lives this entire life without sin the devil could therefore not get a grip on him because he had no sin in his life instead Jesus grips the devil and starts what we read to destroy the devil's work did good destroyed his work so even though he was personally innocent he's now sentenced to death and I want to slow down right here. God in flesh take the sin of the world upon himself. He drinks from that cup. God born as a man represent humanity and pays the price for sin. Jesus become one with our sin. And the innocent one dies for the guilty. That's you. And that's me. He takes my sin upon himself and pays the price. And God dies as a man. And all the sin of the world dies with Jesus. Carries it into death. But now, since Jesus never sinned personally, death had no right to hold him back. But Jesus raises from the dead. 
He walks out of that grave. The power of death could not hold him back. The power of sin had no right to keep him. But he walks out of that grave. But the good news are, he leaves my sin behind. And now he's stepping out. He, we don't know exactly how this happened because the Bible doesn't tell us. I'm going to watch the movie when I get to heaven. So I want to know exactly what happened. But somewhere in this time, Jesus steps on the devil's head and crushes his head. And he says that he takes the authority back, the keys back from the evil one. And then when he meets with his disciples in Matthew 28, he says, All authority has now been given unto me. Therefore... Go and make disciples in every nation. Therefore, do something about this world. He establishes a new kingdom. And he's telling the disciples, you and me, he says, now believe in me. And I will establish a new covenant with you. Everything I have now belongs to you. And everything you have, I take. Your sin, your shame, your guilt, oh, your bad conscience, give it to me. And I will give you peace and joy and freedom and forgiveness of sin. And I will give you a purpose in life again. And he says, believe in me and I forgive you your sin. Believe in me and call for my help. And I'll be there every time you ask of me. Redemption takes place. And Jesus dies for you. And all you have to do today is to change lordship again. To turn from the devil. Turn from the sin. A life in sin. When I'm a slave to sin and say, God, I need your help. Please forgive me of sin. And sin loses its power. And I can turn to Jesus. And I can say, Jesus, you are now my Lord. And the Bible says, if you confess Jesus as, as your Lord with your mouth, you will be saved. This is redemption. This is, this is what happens now. You are saved. Death and sin has no longer any authority in your life. The Bible says it's like this, Colossians 1.13. He has rescued us from the dominion, from the power, from the, the nation, from the kingdom of darkness. And transferred us into the kingdom of the Son that He loves. He took you from this kingdom, the world influence, where the devil had control. And He lifted you out of there and He placed you in the kingdom, a new kingdom, the kingdom of God. Of the son that he loves. In him we have redemption. And the forgiveness of sins. So in an instant we are now free of sin. Not because of us but because what he did for us. And I can come back to the purpose of life. I can now again have a love relationship with God again. Listen. This will sum everything up. God is not a God that will allow evil to reign. God is good all the time. And God is not passively sitting back just watching all the suffering that is taking place. God is not a God of confusion saying, God, if you're almighty and if you're good, why is all of this happening? I'm not saying that we can answer every question, but I know one thing. God is not passive. God did something about the evil 2,000 years ago. God became man and he paid the price for my sin and he rescued me. From the evil hands of the enemy and put me in a new kingdom. And then, listen, he's still patiently waiting. Sometimes I'm, I'm praying, God, come back now. Take me home to heaven now. But God is always saying, no, I'm still patiently waiting because he wants more people to hear. Get a chance to get to know him. But one day, that farm lease is over. And God will judge the devil, sin and death. And the Bible says they do not exist anymore. They will be judged and taken away. That is our glorious hope. And meanwhile, I want to wrap up with this scripture. This is what I want you to be charged with tonight. If you don't understand anything, if you forget everything else I said, if you, if you said I didn't get anything down, you like, might have been your Swinglish or whatever, but I didn't get it. Now listen, if you, if you walk away with this, this is all you need. Therefore, we are now ambassadors for Christ. Since God is making his appeal 
through us. We plead on Christ's behalf. Be reconciled with God. Six years ago before I moved here with my family from Sweden, we had to go to the American Embassy in Stockholm. I know the address. If you drop me in Stockholm now, I will be able to drive there right away. It's, it's a big, big building, a, a big piece of land. And we had to stand in line with our passport. And, and they searched us. And the moment they led us through with our passport to get our visas to move here, when I, when I walked through that gate into the embassy, I left Sweden legally and I walked into American law. And even though I was still geographically in Sweden, I was now under the authority of America. If I commit a crime inside those gates, I would be judged by American law, not Swedish law. That is the power and the beauty of an embassy. And now the Bible says this, listen, you are an ambassador for Christ. This world may still be under the control of the evil one. But you know what God's solution is? It's you. It's me. You are a walking embassy. Wherever you walk, there is a new set of laws walking with you. And you are no longer under the power of the evil one. You don't have to submit to his rules and regulations and law anymore. But you can say, I am in Christ. And I don't have to figure out on my own as an ambassador. I don't have my own personal agenda. I just have to turn to my king and ask him, what is your agenda? What is your will? I'm here to do your will in this place. And he's given me, he's given you the right to now speak and pray in the name of Jesus. When I speak in the name of Jesus, when I pray in the name of Jesus, I re release a new set of laws around myself and I have now the power to invite a sick person into this embassy the Bible says lay your hands on the sick and they will recover why do we have to lay our hands on them because I believe they need to be close enough so they are in the embassy we follow what I'm saying and I have no the right to say devil this is not your territory I might still live in this world but I do not belong to this world I belong to another kingdom and I answer to another king his name is Jesus and I command you in the name of Jesus to go leave you have no power here mm, you have no influence He's got no influence over your life unless you give it. So what is the solution to the theodicy problem? It's you. God has already done something. It might be evil still in this world, but you are the answer. You are the solution. He's given his power to you. You are an empty vessel for him to fill up with his power. All I need to do is to stay available, stay ready. Oh, prepare my heart, prepare my mind to be his vessel every day, wherever I go, in Austin and across the world. If you don't remember anything else from tonight, remember this. When you walk out of here, the presence of God walks with you. Remember this one thing. Next time you open your mouth to pray, heaven and earth are listening. Devils are shivering and shaking because they know. They would try to intimidate you. Who are you, Daniel? Why do you think you can pray? Remember what you did yesterday. I remember clearly what I did yesterday. But you know what? Jesus already forgave me. It's under the blood. And I don't speak. I don't happen to speak on my own agenda. And I don't speak in the power of Daniel. I don't speak in the power of Pastor Chris. I don't speak in the power of Reach Church. I don't represent an organization. I represent and I speak in the name of Jesus. That is who you are. You are the solution. You are the answer to someone's desperate prayer right now. Walk out of here knowing that in faith. Walk out of here with your back straight and your head held high. Because you are the solution. Come on, can we put our hands together and thank Jesus for his word tonight. I know I tried to squeeze way too much into that message. I know I sounded like the machine gun preacher tonight, just spitting out stuff that I could not even pronounce. But I don't care. I prayed for you before you got here. 
I prayed for your heart to receive something tonight. And if you receive anything, receive this. You are an ambassador of Christ. You don't have to qualify. You've been appointed. You don't have to earn it. You've been given it. So you can walk out of here changed. Before we leave, I want to pray a prayer over you. If you can close your eyes. And I want to bless you tonight. Before I pray that prayer, I want to know. Just like Daniel was sitting in a service 21 years ago. Having a desire for something I didn't even know. I didn't understand. I had never heard of. But in that moment, I heard about Jesus. I heard about another kingdom. I heard about the forgiveness of sin. And to be honest, I was 15. I didn't understand it all. But I knew in my heart, I need that. I want that. Just like me 21 years ago this day. I want to give you the same opportunity tonight. If you've never given your life to Jesus. If you never asked Him to forgive you of your sin. If you've never been forgiven, set free. Or if you have in the past but you've been walking away from Him. If, you're not, if you didn't live with Him as your Lord and you desperately want to come back tonight. It's your night. I plead. Reconcile with God tonight and He's here for you. He's knocking at the door to your heart. And I want to count to three. And when I come to three, I want you to lift your hand so I know who I'm praying with. I will not embarrass you. I will not ask you to stand or walk anywhere. I want to pray with you right there where you're seating. But I want to know who you are. So make your hand ready. One, two. Make that decision tonight. Three. Lift your hand. Thank you. 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 Let's pray together. Put that hand on your heart. Pray. And I want everyone to pray with us. I prayed a prayer similar to this, not even knowing what it all meant. 21 years ago when it changed my life, I went to bed that night with a stone lifted off of my heart. I woke up the next morning for the first time in, in years with a smile on my face knowing I live for something greater. I had purpose in my life. So let's pray together. Let's say this. Father God, come on, let's pray out loud. Let's help those who are praying this for the first time. Father God, thank you for loving me. Thank you for sending Jesus. Jesus, I believe in you. Forgive me of my sin. Fill me with your life. Give me a fresh start. Give me a new beginning. Fill me with purpose. Your Holy Spirit. From this day. For the rest of my life. I will walk with you. And follow you. As the Lord of my life. In Jesus name. Amen. Come on can we put our hands together. Congratulations to your spiritual birthday tonight. We share birthday. Write that down in your Bible. I did that the, the night I came home. Someone gave me a Bible. I wrote May 30th, 1997. I got saved. Still have that Bible to this day. Write it. Tell someone tonight. Our prayer team will be up here. If you want someone to pray with you. If you want more of God, be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Don't go. Come up here. Let someone pray with you. If not, I just want to speak a blessing over you. And we're going to see you Sunday. Father God, we declare your blessing. Your life, God. Right now, we, ch we charge everyone in this room. We equip them tonight with your power to be your ambassador. To be your representative and pray and speak with your authority wherever they go. Father, whatever the devil is trying to do against them you are here to destroy the works of the devil right now and you're going to use all prayer and all words to declare your word into that situation father we leave tonight knowing we carry your favor and your blessing upon our faith upon our families upon our finances and into our future in jesus name amen all right have a blessed week we'll see you sunday